Because maybe the reason it's not convincing is that the site of our fear is somewhere else. For the most part, I think it's worth it. I mean, there's no sense in which I think the absurdity of life is a reason it's like acceptable to commit suicide. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Owls at Dawn. We are just two dudes from Southern California who studied philosophy, politics, and religion around the world and decided to start a podcast we could bullshit with impunity. I'm Austin Hayden Smith. And I'm Troy Polidori. And this week, we're going to rush through an episode because Troy has to get going because he's got to watch a baseball game because his beloved <laughs> Red Sox are playing. Are you conflicted at all? I mean, do you have any sort of attachments to the Los Angeles Dodgers? Is this a thing? No, no, not at all. But you're an LA boy. Yeah. That don't mean you shit, don't give though. a fuck. All right. No, don't give All a right. fuck. You fucking front runner, bandwagoner, whatever you are. Yeah, say whatever you will, man. I've been a fan <laughs> of this since before I knew you. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. That's a good point. Um, so today we're going to be doing part two of our The Ethics of Suicide, which was the patron poll selected topic. Last episode, we discussed Albert Camus and his notion of the absurd and philosophical suicide. And this week we're going to discuss a sort of rejoinder to that. One of uh, the articles, at least from Thomas Nagel, on the absurd, called Absurd, is a direct response to Camus. The other death is just a sort of thematic response, let's say, um, incidental response. And yeah, so we'll get into that uh, in a little bit. But, of course, before we do that, we got to start off the episode the way we start off every motherfucking episode. Shitty Minute. This is where one of us gets to rant and rave about whatever it is that is pissing us off at the moment. So, Troy, it's your turn to release. What's up? Yeah, so my Shitty Minute this week, I mean, it's kind of shitty, but it's mostly like something I'm a bit confused about. I wanted to get your opinion on and then maybe huh. pause a little bit what I think about it. So I went and saw one of my favorite bands... Uh, live for the first time uh, last week. Band named Shellac. Is um, that that and, producer dude? Yeah, Steve Albini, who's famous for producing like Nirvana and every other alternative band in the '90s. Uh, he's the front man of the group. And they've been around for 25, 28 years, something like that. And they almost never tour. Uh, very, very rarely do they tour. And so um, this is the first time I've really been able to go see them, and they were fantastic live. Um, this doesn't sound very much like a shitty minute so far, right? Mm-hmm. So, so I was talking to somebody um, who was sort of aware of them, and they're, you know, amongst many other sort of underground bands, lyrically, there's not a lot in their lyrics that makes sense or seems to have a sort of <laughs> okay. your typical, like, expressivist, emotive meaning, right? And it got me thinking... Um, For me, this is never really, I've never really understood how people could sort of not like music or not connect to it because the lyrics didn't have like an expressivist meaning that they could latch onto and empathize with or maybe even Mm -hmm. like reinterpret subjectively, like if it was them saying it, right? Right. Uh, A lot of people treat popular music like that. Mm. Um, And I've never understood it, why that's even a thing that people care about. Not that I'm saying it's wrong or bad. I just literally do not do that. I guess I'm just not wired to do that. And Mm. so um, I have some thoughts about why I actually don't really like the idea in general, but I don't want to obviously say that it's like bad or wrong to do it because, you know, do the fuck you want. You're not harming anybody. Um, But why do you think people have this sort of tendency to interpret music this way? So I'm thinking in my head right now of, you know, the Jerry, famous Jerry Maguire scene when he is singing the Tom Petty Free Fallen. And it's like, I'm free. And I think everybody has those moments where you're like, oh, that's right. I feel free. I'm driving down the road. I'm vibing with Tom Petty. He's saying the things that are in my heart. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think at a very superficial level, it's um, kind of a an expression of social solidarity right as social creatures i mean if you look through i I think that i can say this i'm not a cultural anthropologist but i think we can say this that if you look back through the history of human cultures there have always been song at the heart of community right at the heart of what we are 
Um, I mean, this is why worship music is central. This is why if you look at tribal music, it's central. I was just walking through the train station the other day, and there was an Aboriginal man who was performing Aboriginal music. There is something that is just embedded into the human ethos. I was actually at a series of seminars with uh, Giorgio Agamben, and we were talking about music, and or we were talking about uh, language and the voice and things like that. And somebody that was a part of the workshop, I can't remember who he was, he was some like Italian scholar guy, who was talking about that there are theories among linguists that argue that uh, that language as we have established it as humans is really derived from song. And so he was talking about birds singing and how uh, the sort of mechanism of singing is closely related to what we do when we speak. It's just a different type of singing. So there's something about musicality. There's something about singing that is essentially connected to linguistic consciousness, which I think is reflective consciousness, meta-consciousness, as like Julian Jaynes would call it, right? Um, and so maybe there's just something intrinsic about connecting social meaning, which language is essentially social, it, connecting social meaning with melody and rhythm and things like that. And so when we're singing, we're trying to create a social connection. And sometimes that's what's happening. There's like a there's like a transfer of of ideas from the artist singing the song to us. And I think there are other things too, like inadequacy of being able to express ourselves. And so a lot of times, you know, these highly emotive forms of expression, which music is very emotional because of these other elements of uh, of pitch and things like that that can affect us at the affective level, that those things can latch on to a, a state that we might have that we're struggling through, an anxiety or a tension that we, that we can't really articulate as well. And it allows us an easy way to attach that anxiety or that discrepancy. Yeah, I totally agree with all that. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think my issue is less about whether or not music is is sort of a, a socially, um, I guess like a social, what would you call it, like enactment or event or something like that makes, that yeah. makes obvious sense, especially when you're at a concert, right? Um, it's more, it's why the lyrics get focused on so much, right? Because like I would totally get how a bunch of people listening to the same kind of music or the same type of music might experience the same emotions and thereby have this connection. Um, which they wouldn't otherwise have. Like that makes perfect sense. And it's why songs get used or music gets used in uh, tribal and religious and military endeavors, right? Where social cohesion is so important. Um, but it's like this idea that even when you're solo, like by yourself, the lyrics have to, the lyrics specifically have to have a content that you can sort of apply to yourself. Um, it's like, you know how like a formal logic is defined as some sort of, you know, mechanism which doesn't have any specific content that you can apply to multiple things. Mm. It's almost like the lyrics are like a formal logic. It's just like an empty, contentless, formal relationship of symbols. Mm. And then I have to find a way to use that and map it onto emotions that I feel so I can express them in a way that's like enjoyable or fun or uh, cathartic or whatever, right? It's like mm. that specifically, and I think it's a specifically like American pop culture, you know, 20, 21st century thing. Mm. I, I, I mean, I don't have any evidence of this. I guess it's an empirical question, but I don't think I've heard that from any, from the, from the history books <laughs> at all. Yeah, right? yeah, like, like where people in the 15th century, it, the thing is different is they didn't have pop music in the way that we Yeah, recorded music, you could now. just play anytime you want. That seems to be a huge part of it, right? Right. But were they singing their jigs, you know, that they had or whatever their like the the folk songs that they had? Would they be singing that while they're working in the fields, thinking about it in the same way that we're thinking about it now? Or was it more or was it or was there just a kind of maybe some people were like maybe if you were a musician and you were sitting there, but then you're creating the music. You're not trying to attach to somebody else's lyrics. I wonder what that connection would be. If there are any like ethnomusicologists out there or anything like that, <laughs> let us know. But yeah, I do. I do wonder because it does seem to be a symptom of a very sort of a, a Western, I would say, post-capitalist logic. One where um, we're living these sort of like quantifiable existences, where everything is like 
a, a thing. Everything is a sort of commodified object that we appropriate for ourselves in this game of exchange. And it's just another, I think it's just another expression of commodification. And I don't mean this to be like, everything is the fault of capitalism. I don't mean it like that, because that's not my point. My point is that there's a particular logic that accords with the socioeconomic system that we call capitalism, which is this large, huge system that we need to demystify and not just think is just this homogenous thing, so we don't need to get into that. But one of the ways that capitalism is manifest is in its very cultural logics, or the way that it conditions how it is that we think, and how it is that we exchange our, our systems of meaning. And music is one of the things that would be affected by this, of course, is, or an expression of this type of logic. So I do think that there is something to what you're saying. Like, when you're singing the Justin Bieber song, like, baby, 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 oh, oh, baby. Like, why is that like something like I you're want you? You're picturing somebody whatever. in your head, right? Yeah, like you're you picturing you're supposed a, to, at like least. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And and I mean, Bill, Bill enjoy, Burnham, damn like, it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so I mean, it's like you are or like welcome to the jungle. You're I'm when I hear welcome to the jungle, I'm picturing Los Angeles. You think about doing like, coke. <laughs> well, yeah, that too. <laughs> That too. <laughs> but I'm thinking about like getting off a bus in Los Angeles and it's like when I was a teenager and I used to go up and drive through the hills with my buddies and be like, this is the fucking place, man, you know? And I, I, I don't know, like I, there are things that I attach these things to that I can personalize and it's almost like there's a imitation. Remember our episode on Rene Girard? There's like this imitative sort of experience. I I mean, in the, the frame of my research, I would argue that there's a form of seriality that's going on here. This form of a uh, sort of appropriation of an external image that's that's kind of framing how it is that we even relate to the world, but um, yeah, yeah and I, I mean I don't want to say this is like evaluatively intrinsically bad, right? Um, right. So we're just kind of talking about yeah, the logic here, right? But at the same time, I do kind of want to obviously imply that there's something at least shortchanging about art mm. when it's used only for this this purpose, right? This could be one of its purposes, certainly, and it can be enjoyable for that reason. But it seems like, and I, I get this, you know, because I listen to a lot of experimental music and avant-garde stuff and weird underground stuff. And one of the things I love most about these kinds of music is that they can challenge you. You can not know what they are and then kind of like go searching, right? Um, and there are like inappropriate ways to understand them, right? Oh, it's just mm. noise for noise's sake. Well, I mean, sometimes it is, but yeah, like how do you listen not, to battles? And, and appropriate that to yourself. Oh, yeah, because then you just dance the fuck out of the battles, dude. <laughs> um, right. And break shit. Uh, but yeah, some, there are like inappropriate ways to interpret it. And I think that's accurate. And the problem mm. with like this expressivist model of interpreting a lyrics and music is that it just kind of assumes everything is correct, like some kind of like subjectivism. Mm. And even like artists talk about this now too, right? Just so as not to get in trouble with people. They're just like, well, you just interpret it however you want. I'm not going to tell you what the meaning is. Right. Mm. And it's like, for me, those are not the only two options. Like there's an objective, unchanging, eternal meaning, or it's just up to the individual to make it up themselves. Like you can be a pluralist about this and say that there's multiple true meanings and also a bunch of false ones too, right? Mm -hmm. Ones that fit and ones that don't. And so right. the process of music challenging you and saying, no, this is a false meaning. Like the thing that you're thinking around now is just wrong. Try again. And so you're mm. like, oh, okay, I got to go back and think about it again. What is this thing that I'm listening to? What really is it? And trying to dig into it and figure it out and make a consistent interpretation. Like that's, that's part of the fun and the challenge of listening to music and enjoying art. And it seems like other art forms still really try to do that. Movies certainly do that. I would think that Oil on Canvas and stuff still does that a lot. But music seems so much maybe more commodified. Maybe TV is the same way. I don't know. I think but film it's just is like too. you're not allowed to say that. Well, because what's being packaged is what's being what's it's being packaged for the audience a lot of times, right? And so you're just basically feeding people what it is that they want to hear, which is why, I mean, I have a real problem with pop music because the lyrics are like, here's what everybody says. They all say the same thing, you know. The way that they say it. like sometimes I can actually predict lyrics to a song I've never heard before just because you can tell what they're saying, <laughs> and you know that it's gonna rhyme. And you're like, oh, it's going to rhyme because that's what they do all the time. Oh, damn. You know, where's my man? You're like, what the fuck? Okay, I get it. <laughs> you're so good at this, dude. <laughs> I know, dude. What can I say? I've had a lot of practice with pop music. Um, but 
you know, there, there is, there's, there's a thing that the, there's a, there's a formula that's being followed. And the reason is because they're trying to package it for a broad audience. So this isn't like an accident. This is, this is intentional. If you listen to songwriters and you talk to songwriters, um, they know that this is what they're doing. They, I mean, they may not be like intentionally sitting back like, mm, I have to make this so that it's as broad appeal. Some of them might, I mean, the, the, maybe the execs are like, Hey, let's, let's make this so that it can appeal to as many teenagers as it can so that they attach to it they know they're not fucking dumb but at least for the songwriters it might be more of like a habitual thing that they just kind of get into the frame of these are the words that we're allowed to say in the way that we're allowed to say them and it's kind of just something that you embody like almost unconsciously or at least unintentionally but it's the same thing with film there why are certain films and this is what we'll talk about in my sticky leaves at least is certain films that you're allowed to make and certain other films that somehow get made, you're like, how the fuck did that film get fucking made? You know? <laughs> um, but uh, because it doesn't fit the formula, right? And so th- it, this seems to be a sort of like newer logic of the commodity. It's just a different expression of that same logic of the commodity. Yeah, and I think for me at least, it seems like film still enjoys a little bit of leeway, right? And that you can make an art film and people can enjoy it. It can have a moderate amount of success. And people will still say, oh, that's a film, even if they're like, I don't get it. Or be comfortable with multiple meanings, right? Mm. But then music, it seems like people are not comfortable with that. Like there either has to be a distinct objective meaning or there has to be just only subjectivist, subjectively determined meanings. And mm. for some reason, music doesn't get that leeway that film seems to get. And I want it to. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. I feel you, brother. I feel you. Very interesting. So then, uh, I guess, even though it's not a Sticky Leaves thing, do you recommend that people listen to, is it Schlock or Schlack? Oh, no one's going to like Schlack, dude. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you like noisy music that's completely amelodic, then uh, go listen to Schlack. I'm, I'm going to check it out. I have no fucking clue. <laughs> but you said it was the tightest concert you've ever been to in terms of like actual uh, musical proficiency. So I'm down. If you've ever been in a band, um, the music isn't super complicated. But if you, if you know about, you know, Basically, shellac is like, what if there were no, was no melody, but everything was accents? So like accents in, in a three-piece where they're hitting the same, they're at the exact same tempo, right? And they're hitting the exact same accents in each bar. Um, the whole music is basically just that. Uh, mm-hmm. And it was a, it was a produ- like a audiophile's dream because the guys in the band are all producers. And so they mic'd up the sets as if it was like recording. There were like 30 condenser mics on stage. Oh, wow. It was really elaborately set up, and it sounded so amazing because of that. Were they recording live, you think? No, like I think a... they just do that. They just want it huh. to sound like it's almost like it's a recording done live. Damn. See, the tightest band I ever saw was Dream Theater. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to talk about Dream Theater. <laughs> I have no doubt that they were very tight live, though, because they are very tight. Musicians. Very proficient musicians. All right, so for our main segment today, we're going to be talking about a couple of essays by uh, good old American philosopher Tom Nagel. And these two essays are going to be sort of, if not in direct response, at least like spiritually or thematically in response to Camus. Uh, Nagel does mention Camus at one point in the essay, The Absurd. Um, but it's it's more just he's developing his own argument that we can talk about how it's it's sort of thematically uh, kind mm-hmm. of seen as an alternative to Camus. Yeah. Um, I was thinking we should probably talk about the death essay first, or do you think we should talk about the absurd one first? Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, I actually, in a weird way, I think after reading both of them, I kind of think that they sort of horseshoe uh, together in a weird way. And I'll explain what I mean later, but um, yeah. But yeah, let's, let's start with death. Okay, because yeah, uh, in the death essay, it's Nagel basically arguing for why he thinks, why he thinks death is bad. Like what, what's evaluatively bad about it? And he develops a yeah. theory around that. And then the absurd one, I think kind of assumes you've already read the death one. Um, and so we can go on with that in mind. Um, so cool. in the death essay, the basic um, claim that Nagel makes is that 
life is good in itself. And it's not just the things you get in life that make it good. So that if your sum total of experiences were more bad than good within life, it would still be worthwhile to be living since life itself is good. And he kind of assumes that and then says, if that's the case, what makes death bad? Right. Um, and so you might say, well, death is bad because like it hurts or something. But then that obviously kind of falls into a pit when you realize that as many philosophers have pointed out throughout history, that phenomenologically, consciously, you never experience death. You can't experience death, right? It cannot be a part of experience that is simply the end of experience, like by definition. Hmm. So it can't be some. It can't be death. Right, and this itself is presuming that there's bad. no consciousness after death. Yeah, this is assuming. I mean, even if there was consciousness after death, you could still think of the possibility of that consciousness ending. Like it's certainly possible, even if you don't believe it's going to happen because you think there's eternal life or something. Right. Okay. So yeah, he's kind of assuming that there's either not life after death or we're not sure about it. Or even if there were, we don't know if that would be eternal necessarily. Right. So then the question is what makes death bad? And since it can't be death itself, it can't be like intrinsically bad since it's not a thing you actually experience. And we're kind of assuming there's some sense in which you have to experience something to be bad. Although he kind of said otherwise a little bit later. Um, he, he posits the theory that is basically, it's called deprivation theory, I believe, right? Yeah. In other literature. And it's the idea that death is bad because it deprives us of life and the things life. in life. If <laughs> life is evaluatively good, then of course death will be bad since it deprives mm -hmm. of that very thing which is good, life. Yeah. Which sounds very simple, right? <laughs> yeah, it sounds very simple. You're kind of like, okay, yeah. I, here's the thing that I, I found interesting. Um, I feel like he is, in a way, basing this off of his theory of consciousness from the essay, What Is It Like to Be a Bat? Right? So it's Death is the, is the cessation of the what it is likeness in your experience as a human. You no longer have the capacity to have a what it is likeness. You no longer have a capacity to have a, a, a qualitative or like the qualia subjective experience of the world, which is for him, I think, an intrinsic good. But here, here's where I think there's a problem. He's making these uh, – uh, by ascribing good and bad to something – that is an ontological question, is he not making a category error in the way that he frames the very discussion already? Like, he seems like he's... How so? He's, bl he's blurring, I feel like, an ethical question with an ontological question. Because if death is the cessation of life, um, or let's say the deprivation of life, that's an, that's an ethical question already. Right. Or that's a that's an ethical frame already. But I feel like he's kind of mixing the ontological in this because he's talking about a state of of isness, like that death is a certain way, that life is a certain way, that the relation between these two, I guess one's not a state even. Uh, he says that because death is not a state of life. It's not a state of anything. It's the absolute cessation of a state. So is he not then also sort of like making ontological claims, but he's framing them in terms of the ethical as being either good or bad? And is that not a category error? Well, I mean, I think just some background on Nagel, he works in kind of like deontological Kantian style ethics, right? So there's some sense in which he's going to argue as a, um, you know, moral realist, there are moral facts about the world that the ethical supervenes on the ontological in some way. So with okay. certain ontological changes, if those things are ethically important in some way or ethically relevant, there will be ethical changes as well. So, I mean, you can certainly dispute that, right? There's obvious ways to dispute that. But I think he's kind of just going to be like, assuming this is the case, since I guess maybe the majority of people would think something like this, that there are certain states of affairs which are bad and certain states of affairs which are good. And not just like actions that are good or bad or motives that are good or bad, but states of affairs that are good or bad. If that's the case, and we say that life is one of those states of affairs that's good, then that means death is one of those states of affairs which is bad because it deprives of life. But there's, so, yeah, there's a, a big lot of step sort there. Of, 
but, but why is life a state that we would describe as being good, right? What's the criteria by which we make the determination that something is good versus something is bad? You can't just assume that, oh, well, let's just assume, and I think he does this. He's like, life seems to be good because we have this experience of things that are good. And I'm not sure, I wasn't convinced ultimately by that argument, that life essentially is a good and that death therefore is bad because of the depriving of that uh, conscious experience of living. What would be the argument against that? Because that seems like an, an intuitive thing that almost everyone thinks. What's the argument against it? Um, well, that good is a contingent category that humans have created to um, kind of express maybe positive feelings about uh, sets of contingent uh, contingent experiences. So the word good is an abstraction. It's not something that is some sort of foundational ontological principle from which we derive things. I think good is an abstraction of, um, of various material experiences. So we need to then argue what is goodness, right? We need to figure out what is goodness here. We can't just presume that life is a good in itself. I mean, some people would literally argue the opposite, that life is a bad, life is suffering, that life is not necessarily good. Now, that's a very morose and probably minoritarian view, but... Well, they're still moral realists then. They accept all that stuff about the ethical supervening on the ontological, just in the reverse. Right. Sure, but the point is, right. is that it if seems you have like two people... The much that's actually not that different right. of you. The much different view is the sort of like relativist or subjectivist or nihilist view that there are no such things as good or bad except what's you know socially constructed or whatever. That's the much right. more alien view to Nagel's. Certainly, you can say that, right? Um, and you know the, the nihilist and the subjectivist views, you know, the contrary to moral realism, you know, had their proponents, right? But I mean, obviously, Nagel is just kind of assuming that this is the case. Um, and I think he, you know, he makes an analogy in the absurd article, which I think we can bring up now because I think it's relevant. And he says, you know, um, skepticism about the external world is a live option. Like it might very well be the case that we're all brains and vats or in the matrix or, you know, in some sense, the world's not real um, external to our perceptions. Right. But we kind of act like it is anyway. Right. Um, even when we sort of think otherwise or have reasons to think otherwise. Um, and so we kind of do the same thing when it comes to whether or not there are actual things that are objectively good. We just kind of realize that it's possible there's not, right? It's very a you know, live option that it's not. But mm -hmm. then usually we typically just live like it is anyway, knowing that's the case. And now why we do that is an important question, but I think it's pretty accurate that even admitting skepticism is a live option. We still live otherwise. Right. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So with the, with the absurd article, the reason I said that I think that it kind of horseshoes around is I think that actually he ends up, uh, whether intentionally or not, making the argument that death is actually absurd, not evil. And the reason I think that's the case is because he says that um, the definition of the absurd is like a discrepancy between a pretension or an expectation and reality. So it, my, my concern is, is that in the death article, he, even though he says that death is not a state, um, he does give it some sort of like causal efficacy when he's talking about it in its like relational difference to, difference to life, right? That somehow it's, it's an evil because when somebody has died that that person is deprived from all the possible experiences that person could have. So someone's dead for a thousand years. It's just as evil that uh, – I don't know. Joan of Arc is dead now because she's not able to experience in and out, right? So that's that's an evil because she's deprived of the potential of that experience is, I guess, a way that we could think about that. Um, so in itself, there is some sort of bad relational judgment that we can make here. But the problem is, is that still makes death as some sort of like active agent. And I'm not sure that death ever is an active agent. Again, I'm just not sure I like the way that he frames the discussion. Does that make sense? That it just doesn't seem, because death doesn't deprive anyone of anything. It's not active. It's not actually depriving you. It doesn't do anything. It isn't. It's, it's just, death is the word that we use to describe the loss of life. It's, 
It's not an active thing that is continuing to happen. So it's not continually depriving you except in some sort of imagined, fabricated, differential relation that is projected by the other people who are still continuing to live life or that you project as some sort of future certainty. But it's not actually doing that. I guess I don't really see that he's making death out to be an active agent, um, but rather it's just a description of a state of affairs. But right? it's, he says it's not a state. It's not a, it's not a conscious mental state, right? Like experiences. It's the end of that, right? But it is a state of affairs, meaning a state of the world that you okay. know, X, is, X is dead or whatever. And so the di what's the difference between, you know, X is alive and X is dead or X is not alive, right? The cessation of that. Well, death is just a description of that difference in state of affairs. So, I mean, I... So I but then how he, is it depriving? But then how is it depriving? Because he says deprives and he's using the continuous, but it's not... I, I just don't... I, I think that's my problem. I'm not sure that it's like some sort of continuous active verb that well, we can apply. Let's think about it this way. He, he wants the, this essay to kind of answer the problem of, what's he call it? Like temporal asymmetry or something. So like the ancient Greek philosopher Lucretius came up with the, the famous argument that it's irrational to fear death because um, death is just a state of an existence, right? And we were inexistent before we were born and we don't have any worries about that and anxiety about that. But then all of a sudden we have all this anxiety and fear about posthumous in existence. And since those are two states that are exactly the same, right? Why would we not even think about one, not give any care towards one, but then fear the other? It's irrational. We should just not care about either one since it won't be us. We won't be there to fear it right. or to experience yeah. it at all. And that, I don't know about you, but that's always felt to me like really convincing and then really unconvincing at the same time. This is like the yeah. first time I heard it, probably in like college or something. It was like, oh yeah, that's totally right. But then it does nothing for me as far as, you know, like persuading me to not fear death or not even care about death. Right. Well, I mean, it's uh, for me, I was more uh, introduced to this through Epicurus, who makes a very similar argument. Um, but mm -hmm. it's basically about pain and pleasure, you know, that there will be no experience of pain and pleasure. So there is no reason to, uh, to fear death. Um, but it's the same sort of argument. And to me, I found that if you presume that there is no afterlife whatsoever, then to me that is actually a very convincing, at least intellectual argument, right? It's very coherent. But I, just because it's not convincing doesn't mean that that's not necessarily a good argument because maybe the reason it's not convincing oh, yeah. is that the site of our fear is somewhere else. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. Um, just because the, the lack of sort of persuading our, our actions or making us change our life does nothing about the argument. It probably says more about us. Than anything else, um, but I, but I think his response to it's kind of interesting and it's something I hadn't really thought about before I read the essay, and so his response to uh, the temporal asymmetry argument from Lucretius and Epicurus and others is that well that argument only holds um, if it's the case that pre life in existence and post life in existence are the same, but they're not by virtue of the fact that prenatal in existence is not a deprivation, but that posthumous in existence is deprivation because you could have lived longer, right? And whereas there's no sense in which you could have lived before you lived, well, yeah, you could have been born like nine months before you were or 10 years before you were, right? But then that wouldn't have nothing to do with sort of um, your overall lifespan, right? It's more like yeah. we could always live longer. We have this like intuition that we technically could just always live forever. Like these Cartesian souls who kind of like float around for all eternity. Like we could do that, but then we don't. And so that difference between the possible and the actual is like the bad thing. Right? It could be longer or eternal, but it's not. Right. Well, this is where I think Lucretius' argument is a little bit weak, but also I think that Nagel's rejoinder is weak. And this is why I think that actually what he ultimately ends up arguing, if you take these two articles together, is that death isn't evil, but it's absurd. Because that's precisely what he argues absurdism is. It's that discrepancy between expectation and reality. If that's what absurdism is, then all he ends up arguing is that death isn't evil, but that it's absurd because it's a discrepancy between our expectation that we're going to continue to have these experiences 
and the reality that at some point we're going to be deprived of those experiences. So that doesn't mean that death is evil. That means that death is absurd by his very own definition, right? Well, and no, so, he, doesn't say, he doesn't say that the absurd is expectations versus reality. He actually said yeah, this, he does. it's not a... No, he, he literally doesn't say that. Um, he says that's kind of what he thinks Camus is doing. Are you sure? I he, swear to God, I he, thought... Oh, yeah. He, he literally says the problem with that kind of thinking is that it assumes that the absurd is about our relation to the world, right? Our expectations versus the reality of the world. And he says it's not. The absurd is literally only within us. It's our practice of thinking about ourselves, almost like our second order thoughts, our thoughts about our own thoughts. That's what produces the absurd. It's a unique feature about being human, or cognitively human, that brings out the absurd. Right, but isn't it? But it's still based on the discrepancy between pretension and expectation and rea- or expectation and reality, isn't it? It's no, not. It's not externalized in the world outside of us, but it's still something that takes place within. Well, no, I think what he's saying about the absurd is that it's all about our practice of justification, right? We give reasons for why we do what we do, and the weird thing is those reasons either come to an abrupt end, and that makes no sense because they're then groundless. Or they just go on forever, and we, they're circular. And neither of those seems very satisfying. It's all about sort of our process of justifying our beliefs and our actions. And it's pretty absurd that we still go on living as if our life is meaningful, even though when we're asked, why is it meaningful, we engage in some, this weird justificatory practice that's groundless or circular. But yet, even knowing that, we still do it anyway. So it's hmm. kind of like the Camus thing, but the, it's got really nothing to do with what's out there in the world. It's kind of like the Cohen episode that we did uh, when he's talking about the idea of like justifying these beliefs that you know are in a way sort of contingent. Like if I was at this school versus that school, then I'd have a completely different view of things and becoming aware of that absurdity. Yeah, totally. Right. That's like such an interesting thing. I love that because... That's, I think that's absolutely, especially if you like study philosophy for any amount of time and you like care about the existential parts of philosophy, like you're not just like, what is language doing? And that's all you spend your time on. Like you just care about, you know, why are we doing what we're doing? What the hell is the world about? Um, those kind of like deep questions that people actually get interested in philosophy by they're thinking about. Um, you eventually find out that it's like, yeah, I guess I can try to give good reasons for things and I try to, but like anybody who thinks that they've done it and are finished, like, that's, that's just either hubris or ignorance, right? Like, it's, there's no way. It's kind of a hmm. mystery still. It's always going to be that way. And yet we still want to do it anyway. Hmm. Okay. Um, so how do you think this applies to the idea of suicide then? Like, do you think he argues convincingly? I mean, first of all, are you convinced by the argument that death is evil? I mean, I'm, I'm convinced by the conclusion. I do have this really strong intuition and i think belief that death is just bad um i don't know that i'm convinced by the deprivation theory though something about it just seems a little off um and i'm not sure i can quite put my finger on it but it seems like so so nagel makes a bunch of uh claims following the deprivation theory idea right like um one of them is that uh a person's history matters a lot for determining whether something is good or bad that befalls them, right? So if uh, so, if people are like lying to you behind your back, like it's the Truman Show, right? And you're being tricked your entire life into believing your life is a certain way when everyone's lying to you. Even if you never figure that out, that's bad. That state of affairs is bad. Um, and I, I really kind of, I really think that that's correct. But then he makes another claim, like um, it's the idea that like uh, an 80 year old who dies um, hasn't suffered as much of an evil as a 20 year old who dies. And then like, it seems like he's going to say also that like a infant or baby who dies hasn't really developed this, um, enough of a life to be deprived of. Right. And so it's not really that bad. It's bad. I shouldn't say it's not that bad. It's not like as bad as someone who's maybe like 25 in the prime of their life. And that seems to follow kind of from this deprivation idea, right? You have to have something to be deprived of it. So if you don't have it yet, you can't be deprived of it. That's his whole answer to the Lucretius Epicurus, you know, um, temporal asymmetry problem. But it seems to me like we do think that it's really, really bad when like a two-year-old dies. In large part, 
because they're gonna have a future life that's they've now been deprived of even though they never really had it in the first place what do you think about that idea this made me think of i don't know if we talked about it on the podcast but there was the princeton scholar and i can't remember her name but she develops an argument for why is abortion traumatic for certain women if we're going to con- if we're going to argue that it's not actually a baby but that it's a fetus uh, during certain stages of development and her argument is based on i think she calls it like the actual future principle or the future actual principle which is this idea is that once you have decided to introduce this budding fetus into your system of meaning you've created a sort of like actualization of this projection of what the baby will be you've started planning i'm going to make a room for uh this future baby i'm going to you know start getting my finances in order so that we can take care of this future baby you've incorporated the fetus into a system of society and so at that point you've like actualized uh, a future projection of the what is still a fetus at this point. So at the biological or ontological level in the present, it's still a fetus, but in a sort of like imagined sense of social meaning, you've granted it a status as personhood. You've granted it personhood. And that's why it could still be traumatic for a mother uh, and a father who end up going through the uh, – they decide to end, uh, end, end a pregnancy. They have an abortion. Um, so that's one of the things that she argues. And I was kind of thinking how that might pertain to this too, right? Does that make sense? Did you see that? At all? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's exactly right. But also, I think that fits Nagel's argument because that would mean that when a baby dies, um, it's really the the parents' expectations that have right. been deprived, not the baby's, because the baby doesn't have those yet. We've included the baby into the social community as a person, but the baby itself has not sort of internalized that yet. Right. Uh, so I think that would actually fit Nagel's idea. I guess I just still want to think that there's some sense in which, no, actually, the baby lost out too. Um, but I don't. But yeah, it doesn't really have those like those. Yeah, because the baby doesn't know that it lost out. Like, a, like when an infant dies, the baby doesn't know that it's not going to get to experience in and out. That sucks, though, man. Don't that's don't say dark things like that. It's so sad. <laughs> well, so here's the thing. Here's here's the thing where I kind of get caught up is I think that we need to make a distinction between ethics and ontology here, and this is where I'm not sure that I like the blurring of the lines because for me, I'm not sure that we can say objectively. That death in itself, which is what he wants to argue, death in itself is bad because I think that when I, I, I want to make – for me, everything is relational, right? So things only exist in relation to something else. And he kind of makes that argument here. Death is only bad in relation to the deprivation of potential future experiences, right? Or the deprivation of um, – your expectations of future experiences, whatever. So it's it's there's a difference or there's a relationality here, and so things are are only mattering in their relationality. But and so I'm I'm cool with that. Like I want to I want to espouse that. Maybe he wouldn't like the way that I framed that, but that's to me it seems like that's what he's doing. And so I want to say that that death in itself is not bad. Death is bad only in relation to these social meanings that we've attached to what death takes away. And then if that's the case, then we're talking at two different levels here because then we have to talk then at the level of the social, which is where these ideas of good and bad exist, not at the level of ontology. So in itself, is death bad? I I think that that's the framing of the question is itself wrong. We can say that, yeah, it sucks for us as a community because we experience loss of that individual or it sucks sucks for us in the moment because we realize that we're not going to be able to experience flying cars or whatever it is. Right, so there's a sense in which we will be deprived from these uh, these experiences of life that we have now, um, but I'm just not sure that that saying that therefore death in itself is a bad is the appropriate way to frame it. It's that death is relationally bad, insofar as we no longer get to experience those imagined sites of joy or those imagined experiences. But I, I'm not sure that's death in itself. Here's what I think I'd say to that. Um... Big point and then like small point. Like big picture, the social is the ontological. Like things that exist, even if they're socially constructed, are still ontological. Like their existence. Existence, as in like you know, E-X-I-S-T-E-N-T-S or T-E-N, yeah, N-T-S. They're existing things. And so I don't think that you can like remove the social from the ontological in that way. Um, but then the small point from that, I think, is that my worry when you get into this social relational you know, construction type of thinking about you know, evaluative concepts like good and bad, 
is, well, it's certainly true to some extent that, you know, lots of things that we call good or bad are socially constructed as being so. Um, if they all are, if everything is, and if the ground of the very notion of things being, having sort of a moral status or moral quality to them is pure construction, then I don't think there is an answer about whether suicide is like a good or bad outcome. Like what if you don't have imagined joys? In fact, you think life is just terrible for yourself. Then there seems to me that there's no actual reason we can appeal to to keep living. That doesn't mean that's not, you know, I'm not going to do like a slippery slope thing and be like, if we believe this, then we're all going to commit suicide. Obviously not. I just think that there clearly is a sense in which life is worth living. And I would tell somebody that was contemplating suicide that it is and try to convince them that it is in reality, like not just try to like, you know, construct a new sense of good according to which they might accept that life is good. Um, I don't think you can do that if you just fall into the, you know, constructivist territory. Yeah, but then my, my fear is, is, is the only reason you're resistant just because you want to have some sort of pragmatic answer. It's like you're saying that you can't do that because it, it doesn't give you recourse to be able to give somebody hope to not take their life, which is, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I'm just not sure from a philosophical perspective that that's sufficient. As yeah, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that at all. Um, okay. I, I mean, I, I, that's the slippery slope argument, right? That I'm trying okay. to say I'm, I'm avoiding. I'm trying to avoid at least. I'm, what I'm trying right. to say is I have this really deep intuition that life is worth living, even if it's really, really bad. Not necessarily always worth living. There are certainly circumstances where I would think that the bad outweighs the good to the point where death might be you know, an escape and a legitimate one. Yeah. But for the most part, I think it's worth living. There's no sense in which I think the absurdity of life is a reason by in virtue of which it's like acceptable to commit suicide. I think that's absolutely true. And I'm trying to think, why would I think that? Um, is there any justification for that? And so that's mm. sort of where this comes from. Well, you know, we do tend to think that certain things are sort of intrinsically good or bad. Um, do we have any justification for that? Well, maybe we do. And then we'll keep going down that train and then we fall back into that absurd thing where it's like, eventually we just kind of settle on the idea that some things are just primary goods, like seeking knowledge and experience and probably pleasure too. And so those hmm. things are worth seeking in their own right. Why are they worth seeking in their own right? Well, here's some reasons, but eventually I'm going to find myself groundless when it comes to those reasons. Well, you know what? We're kind of groundless about everything. We're groundless about every single <laughs> thing that we know, period, if you get down to it. That's what the absurd yeah. is. I don't even know that, you know, I exist. Like, go back to Hume. How do I know I exist, not just there's a thing that's thinking, right? Like, you could do that with basically everything. And it's kind of fun to do that. And it's a good challenge because it keeps you humble about what you think you know. Um, but I don't think that the fact that those things are ultimately kind of groundless is reason to give up because I don't see any other way that they could be other than groundless. Like, what like, do you think? Nigga, really quick, Nigga makes a good yeah, point. Yeah. Um, what if they weren't groundless? What if actually we found out that our entire purpose to life was to be food for much larger, more violent creatures? Like, would that all of a sudden make everything not absurd? Like, I don't think so, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. That would suck. <laughs> so, um, it's not like having an, a grounded, clear purpose makes things better, necessarily. It doesn't. Um, so this groundlessness isn't necessarily like a terrible outcome. Hmm. What do you think of... Uh, because I feel like there's also a very sort of like Western ethos here. And I'm wondering if maybe a sort of more Buddhist argument would be that and this is like a, maybe like a nihilistic Buddhist reading, but it would be, well, Nagel is just arguing to have greater attachments to the world, and that's what gives life value. Whereas for the Buddhist, it would be actually that's the source of suffering, and that really it's about detachment from all of those very things that Nagel says in, is an intrinsic good. That's interesting, right? Maybe not even Buddhism, but like even Hinduism, right? It's escape right. from experience. Right. That's the goal. Um, so you want to get out of the the sort of cycle of samsara or whatever and go into like groundless non-experiential oneness with the universe or something. Right. Um, 
that's interesting, right? So what do you do with stuff like that? Um, I mean, I don't know. I haven't really thought about that in connection with this, but I want to get your opinion, but let me just say one thing. Um, I think sometimes people misinterpret some of the Eastern religions, especially Buddhism. Um, Buddhism doesn't say that like, just because there's no self doesn't mean that there's not an experiencing thing. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. So they do admit of experience and experience exists. And I don't necessarily think that they're going to argue experience is bad. It's a certain kind of experience that's bad. And it's this whole like wanting, desiring machine thing that we have that makes us suffer. Like that's the bad part, right? And they certainly think that suffering is bad. So they're not going to disagree about there being moral status to certain experiences in the negative sense, right? Suffering is absolutely bad. Um, So I don't know if there's as, as much antagonism here as there might seem. But what do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I agree with that because I think that then Nagel would kind of say, yeah, I'm not saying to have like, I don't know, these overinflated desires and overattach ourselves to things, but that experience per se is a good. I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly, this whole episode, I'm just kind of musing because I don't really know. I, something doesn't sit right with his argument. Something, something just seems off. Uh, I think the way that he's framing it just seems off. And so as I'm reading this, all these other ideas of like different conceptions of the experience of death were flooding into my mind where death isn't necessarily something to fear, but simply like from, okay, from a purely scientific perspective, it's just like a transfer of energy, right? If, if we're atheists and we're like just using scientism in like the most reductive way possible, death isn't a bad thing. It's just fucking what happens. Right, yeah, that's it's just, just incorrect, is. though. <laughs> <laughs> right, but 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 the point is that there are a lot of people that might think this way, but nevertheless, well, I think the I people are still really afraid do. of death. They might say it. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But they're still afraid, and so there's a there's one there's a discrepancy in our experience of death. No matter even if we're using the most reductive argument or like the sort of Lucretian or Epicurean argument that like the cessation of pain or the cessation of pleasure isn't something to fear, or that you know. Uh, that nothing happens and that when nothing happens, why were, why would you be afraid of nothingness? Um, but then at the same time, I'm, I'm thinking about the sort of like Eastern idea of like uh, a sort of connection with oneness. I'm thinking about Plato and the idea that death is like a sort of a good actually because it's a sort of um, uh, coming back together with the forms that we've like been violently ripped from through our embodiment. And I'm thinking of these alternative arguments that are kind of swirling around this and and there are various other people that have looked at death in very positive ways. And I'm just not sure – I don't know. I, first of all, I just have a problem whenever someone starts to say that something in itself is a thing. Like I'm just such a relationist. Like everything for me, like relational ontology is kind of how I just kind of view things. And so it's just really hard for me to think of anything in itself. So then I'm thinking, okay, so then what are the relations that make death bad? Because I don't buy the idea that death in itself is bad. I don't buy that argument at all. I just think that sounds ludicrous to me Um, because death is – I'm having a hard time getting from the ethical to the ontological. Like I still see a gap there. And yeah, I do think that the social is ontological, but at the same time, I think that from an analytic perspective, we can make a distinction. Maybe in like real material terms, they might be co-constitutive or kind of like obverses of each other. But from an analytic perspective, we can make a distinction. There are distinctions there, even if it's just a distinction of degree. Um, And so it's just for something – there's just something that doesn't fit here and – and I think that part of the reason is because I think he's so wedded to this particular form of like technological reason, right? That that he's he's attaching himself to like determining or or like carving out, like inscribing these bits of meaning in a way, and arguing that 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 inscription of of life itself as an experiential thing is a good in itself. And I'm not sure that that's necessarily the case. I think that that's. That's the case for Western technological reason, but I'm not sure that that's necessarily the case per se. Well, okay, let me ask you this then. Uh, yeah. Suppose some homeless guy in the middle of nowhere dies under a bridge and no one knows that it happened, right? And it was this like terrible ordeal. Then later, a couple of days later, people find him and then realize this like terrible thing happened, right? 
it didn't become bad when they found out about it, right? Like, is the pain experienced by these people knowing about what happened, is that when it was bad? Well, but then again, okay, bad for whom? Bad in what way? Bad towards well, what any end? Any badness. Well, that's what I mean. Any badness but, at all. But, well, sure, but then to me, badness doesn't exist outside of those relational questions. So it was bad for him maybe because he was alone and sick and it was painful in his death. Maybe it's bad for him because he will no longer get to experience human joys. Maybe it's bad for him in some ways. Maybe it's good for him because now he is released from a fucking illness or uh, from pain and misery. Maybe it's good for him in some ways. So for me, there are these relational questions that swirl around this. And then it's bad for them because now they experience the sadness of this loss of life. And now it's bad for society because now his family members are going to experience this grief. So you, you see what I mean? There are I what? cannot understand the idea of goodness and badness outside of the relations to what is it bad for, to whom is it bad, in what way is it bad, towards what end is it bad, etc. Well, it seems to me like you're kind of saying two different things. Like relational as a catch-all term for anything that could involve multiple items in any sort of causal interaction. And like relational meaning like the ontology is literally relational. Um, which, okay, to say that it has to be bad for somebody to be bad, okay, yeah, I mean, I think Nagel agrees with that. I definitely agree with that. Um, but if it's bad for the guy who died because he's deprived of some future life, or maybe even good for him because he's released from some horrible pain or sickness, that's not a relational thing. That's like a subjective thing, right? It's good or bad for him, which is totally fine. Um, but it's, good or, bad that, for it's him. good or bad for him, even if nobody else knows about it or is aware right, but of it's it. A, but it's only good or bad for him because of the relation that it deprives him of something. Well, yeah, sure. It, it's still relational. If, if only he existed and nothing else did, then yeah, maybe this wouldn't work out, right? Like that's fine. The other things out there help cause the goodness or badness, right? But the badness is his. <sighs> like maybe, maybe we're just maybe we're just like talking past each other on this point yeah but it seems like i think you can sort of be comfortable with the fact that you if you were the only item in existence then good or bad things couldn't happen to you i guess that's true yeah i think that's probably true um but there's well, some wait, sort of then, relational why is that sense. true well, there's some sort of relational sense to goodness and badness right especially when it comes to like human beings Right. If I break a piece of wood, I don't think that's bad. If I break a person in half, that is. Well, why? Aren't they all just made of atoms? Well, yeah, but they're made in atoms in such a way that it's different. Um, and it's bad because I did it to them and they don't get to go home to their family and all the other things that involve relations between individuals and individuals and things and stuff like that. Um, I'm totally comfortable with that. I think the the idea is just the goodness itself isn't like some sort of relation between people. It's caused by relations between people, but it's sort of like epiphenomenal to that in some sense. So that I think it's very clear to say that if that person dies under the bridge somewhere and you find out about it, whether it was good or bad for him, depending upon his state beforehand, it was good or bad before you found out about it. That goodness is not a relation between you and him. Right, you're discovering it, not sort of creating it. I mean, do you not think that it's both good and bad? And this is, I think, my my issue is that it's good and bad depending on the differential relation that we're using to make the assessment. And that's the only oh, sure, thing, right? Right, but that but so then that means it's not a bad in itself. Like maybe well, yeah, it's good it, it's, it's in this way and it's bad it in these other ways. It is good or bad in itself. Say that again. Epi epiphenomenal things can be good or bad, um, depending upon what causes them. Like they're still intrinsic in some way right so like if if a guy dies and i found out about it like whether or not he died in escaping from pain or died um not escaping from pain like didn't want to die that would change whether it was good or bad right but then it would be good or bad intrinsically because of that okay Here, here's a thought experiment what if a uh, jewish child a jewish infant in uh, like 1939 dies in Germany. We would say that that's bad, right? Nagel's argument that that's, that's intrinsically inherently bad. 
Could we not also say, though, actually, it's pretty fucking good that that baby died because it wasn't thrown into, into this, like, internment camp and didn't have to deal with the suffering that his life inevitably would have led to and that he would have experienced greater traumatic life? Was that not a oh, good yeah, thing sure. that he escaped that? You could definitely argue that, but it would be either good or bad, right? And you could argue whether it's one or the other. And you might not See, know whether it's one or the other, right? You might just be epistemically unable to access all that data. But, I mean, and you may not even actually know what constitutes good or bad, like fully, right? You may just have some vague ideas about it. But it still is either going to be good or bad and maybe some degree in between, right? But it's somewhere. And God, it's not I'm just, just going like, to be... It's not just in our discovering it or figuring it out that it becomes good or bad. Like, what if everybody was an anti-Semite and thinks that Jews deserve to die? Like, all of a sudden, that makes it, like, good that the person died? I don't think that has any effect on it at all. See, to me, it does. I'm, I'm going to be so annoying here. I'm going to be so <laughs> annoying. And I don't mean to be. I just, for me, I think, I think that, again, these labels of good and bad are are these social constructs that we use to describe certain things that shift and change. And I'm just not sure that we can absolutely make some sort of once for all determinate declaration that anything ever is just essentially good or bad. It's good or bad because of those differential relations. That's it for me. And that means that most things are both good and bad in the same ways at the same time based on the position uh, by which we make the judgment, right? So it's Death is both good and bad, depending on how we look at it. Like, if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, that sucks because that sounds traumatic and scary and that's going to like make everybody else scary. That's why it was bad that I got hit by a bus. It's also bad because I can't podcast anymore and all y'all motherfuckers out there are just – owls at dawn will just be owl at dawn. And that's just not the same <laughs> ring, you know? So that's I, bad. It's be also bad because I'm no like longer going to have – just quit. <laughs> <laughs> it's also bad because I'm no longer going to be able to have a night – where uh, I take a, you know, a, a wonderful, I, I'm out with a group of friends and we get all drunk and MDMA happens to flow through my system and all of a sudden I'm just beaming with joy. That's a bad thing. I'm not, and then I have amazing pizza in the middle of the night, you know, like, yeah, I'm not going to get to experience it. It's bad in that way. But it's good because I don't have to see the degradation of climate change and get frustrated with people on Twitter. And it's good because of various other reasons, right? I mean... But here's, here's I know that thing, might dude. sound depressing. It might sound like I'm wiggling out of this, but I just – I cannot get away from thinking things in terms of that differential relationality, and that's no, all that thing, matters dude, to me. Is you're using essentialist language even in saying not to use essentialist language. Like you're saying it's good because X. It's bad because Y. Well, no. If you're following this non-essentialist social construction paradigm, it's not good because X. It's not bad because Y. The X and the Y is literally identical to the good or the bad. The relation itself is the good or the bad. It doesn't cause the good or the bad. That's what I'm claiming. I'm claiming the differential relations cause the good or the bad. And that that good or the bad that's caused by those differential relations is an epiphenomenal quality of those relations. And they are either good or bad. And you can argue about which one they are, or the degrees between them or whatever, right? So I think even in like trying to go down this constructivist paradigm, it's so hard to do that because you fall right back into the realist paradigm. Um, that I'm trying to argue for. Like, the reason why it would be bad if you got into a car accident tonight and then there was Owl at Dawn and we went out like Led Zeppelin and never <laughs> played again, that would be bad, a bad thing. Why? Because that relation is bad. Right? There's a property of that relation between you not existing and the podcast not continuing and not being able to talk to you or um, whatever. That would be bad, Right? It has the quality of being bad because that relation is such and such a way. Um, and it's not like if like all of a sudden everybody decided, I don't know how this would be possible because you're like the nicest guy in the world, right? But what if everyone decided Austin was a total dick and wanted him to die? I just don't, I don't see how in the world that would like, that would then be a good thing to die. Like that would make it good necessarily by itself. You don't believe in like, uh, what do they call it? Backward performativity? <laughs> what does that mean? It's like when something like retroactively recreates the meaning or makes the value of the thing itself backwards. Oh, so, yeah, sure. That can happen. Yeah, so maybe it would. Maybe it would be the case. So then maybe yeah. it would be a good thing. Yeah, it would be, but it would actually be a good thing then, right? If like secretly you were planning to blow up the world 
and you getting in the car accident stopped you from doing that. And none of us knew about that until 30 years from now when your secret manifesto got released or whatever. <laughs> like if that happened, I would be very surprised, obviously. Very, very good um, undercover operation doing this whole, I'm a philosopher and I care about what's good in the world and want to make life better <laughs> stuff. Um, but that would mean that we were wrong the whole time that it was bad that you died. It was actually good. I think we would say that too. Oh man, we were totally wrong about this whole situation this whole time. But how does that fit in with Nagel's idea that uh, death is evil in itself? Because you're still then talking about how there is this epiphenomenal possibility for like redefining the goodness and the badness of the thing based on, 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 on new information, let's say. But not for Nagel. Nagel is that it's still bad that I died. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what I think about that. So like I do have this one intuition that's like even when Hitler died, it was kind of bad. But then I'm also like, but so minimally compared to the goodness that he was dead, <laughs> right? Um, and also I want to allow the fact that life could be so bad that even if there is intrinsic value to life, the experiences could be so bad that it's not worth it anymore. Like I think that there could be an occasion when that's the case. I don't think absurdity gives you that reason, but like, you know, pain and suffering might, um, like terminal pain and suffering. And I think that's kind of consistent with Nagel, right? I don't think he says anything about the the idea that like categorically life is so good that no amount of pain could ever counteract that. Well, and I think maybe he would even even argue that the reason that if life is so suffering, or if life life is so full of suffering, the reason that that's bad is because you're still being deprived from life, right? That there's some sort of like in your life, there's some sort of experience of maybe like metaphorically like a death that somehow you're being cut off from the very essence of the thing that makes life good itself, right? Or at least oh, that's interesting. whether it's perceived or not. Well, it, that's part of it, right? Because like being unconscious for like, a, like 20 years or something, being in a coma for 20 years would kind of suck because you're deprived of all the things you could have done in those 20 years, like or a whole bunch of your life, right? But being in pain for that long and being sort of bedridden but still conscious would be worse, right? Because you're not able to do all the things you want to do and you're suffering. Yeah. 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 So, okay. Uh, all this to say, I'm confused because <laughs> <Me this, too. laughs> there's something about this article that just, or about his argument that does not sit right with me. I don't like the idea of thinking that death in itself is wrong. Um, uh, not wrong. I'm not, I'm not, I, I, I'm not sure that I'm making the essentialist argument, and the reason is because – I get what you're saying, but the reason is because even those judgments of good and bad I think are contingent based on the context out of which they emerge um, and that they are contingent. They could have been otherwise. They will be otherwise in, in different contexts. So the, even the, the litmus test of good and bad are themselves constructs. That doesn't mean that there isn't some sort of ontological foundation. I do think that there is some sort of ontological foundation. Like – I do think that the Prozorov text is constantly in the back of my mind, and I've been thinking about this a lot lately, um, that I do, I do like this idea, that I, I do want to argue that there is something that is universally there, right? What is that? I, I'm, I'm not sure. Still working through this madness. Um, what is that ontological ground? Maybe we don't have access to it. Maybe we will always have a, a sort of like pale experience of it. Maybe we will only ever be able to experience epiphenomena of the actual sort of thing, you know, the effects of the thing, but without actually experiencing the thing. Maybe. I don't know. But nevertheless, this idea that like we can make a declaration that death in itself is bad seems to be highly problematic. The idea of deprivation theory just does not seem to be sufficient, that it's simply because we are deprived of life or something like that. I, I'm not sure that that's the case. Um, I do think that there would be different ways of looking at death that help us understand that what we call death, which I think is just a metaphor for a different type of state of affairs or a different type of um, experience of what happens to bodies as they degrade in a particular way. Um, I do think that, that there are other ways of looking at death that aren't so black or white, but that look at it as kind of a, maybe it's not either a good or a bad, it's just a thing. Maybe it just is. Maybe it's an isness. Maybe it's an ontological thing and not at all a social thing until we incorporate it into our webs of social meaning. Um, so I'm working through all of this. I don't know. I just know that I'm not comfortable with Nagel's argument at all. Yeah, and I think a lot of what you're saying is really an important point to make about the sort of being unsure about this stuff. 
like I don't think Nagel's writing these essays to be like this is the philosophical position par excellence. No, no, no. Like I think these two essays especially are are like, hey, here's an exploration of why maybe death is bad, and here's an exploration of why maybe Camus' sense of the absurd is a little what does he say, self pitying and romantic, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and why the absurd might actually be just kind of a feature of the way that we think, um, which is really interesting. And what I like about it is that unlike a lot of essays in analytic philosophy, it's kind of like it's like a I don't know what you call it, like a, like a shots fired. Like, hey, here's an idea. Yeah. Like, let's run with it. Let's play with it a little bit and see if we can come with anything interesting. And it starts conversation more than it ends it, which is very rare. <laughs> for Right. Or it's a really good sign of a good philosophical essay, I think, when it starts conversation um, more than, like, tries to end it. Hmm. So in conclusion here to this thing that we had no real answer to um how what do we think about this in relation to suicide i mean we briefly touched on it and i think the it everything that we said it it implies the question of the ethics of suicide but this then mean would arg would mean from nagel's perspective that suicide is essentially a bad thing because death is essentially a bad thing and is it because then from nagel's perspective at least that suicide deprives one of the potential of future experiences yeah, I mean, mostly, right? It wouldn't be that suicide's intrinsically bad. I don't think any action's intrinsically bad. Um, but that it would have to be a really extreme case of suffering and no hope that the suffering was going to end. That would be sort of a, a good reason for suicide. Um, so and, think, now, well, real quick, do you think that we could say that there's good reasons, but nevertheless, the, the act of death itself or the the state of affair of death itself is still bad and that there is a contra that, that there's a point of tension there that well, suicide sort of hovers around. I don't think it'd be tension as much as just degree, right? Like there's some badness here in the death and the lack of sort of having any more experiences, but also a goodness in the relief and alleviation of suffering and the goodness of the alleviation of suffering. If it outweighs um, the badness is probably okay. Like I'm totally fine with, you know, active euthanasia of people who are terminal and have no hope of living a, a life that's not full of intense suffering for, you know, a very limited time. I think that's fine. And that's fully consistent with this idea. But I think it would be sort of in rejection of the idea that you could sort of rationally just look at life and determine that it's bad without any sort of uh, recognition that the experiences play a role in that, right? Like the, the, the philosophical suicide idea where you just realize life is meaningless and then shoot yourself. Um, that's what Nagel's rejecting. And I think, I think that's right. Um, why that's right is super hard because <laughs> it means yeah. giving justification for all sorts of things that it's really hard to give justification for and that justification typically ends up being circular or groundless. But that's probably okay is his point. Probably. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, interesting. I don't know. I don't know. I, I've been thinking a lot lately, and I feel like, as weird and maybe kind of dark as this might sound, I feel like I'm becoming more comfortable with the idea of death. And so I think maybe that's another reason why I'm... I, I'm, like, I'm balking at his argument. It's because... Like, yeah, it still scares me. But I think part of the reason it scares me is because I still am not sure about the idea of the afterlife because I still have that Christian guilt that haunts me. <laughs> right? Well, I mean, so, but, but honestly, I think if I were 100% committed to the idea that there was no such thing as the afterlife or, or if I believed something else, like when you die, you're just a part of your tradition and your ancestors or something like that. I, I mean, I think I would view death in a completely different way. But I think for me... And this is what's so hard. My subjective fear of death is still tied to that guilt of my past that I cannot shake, you know? Like when I get on an airplane, like what do they say? There are no atheists in foxholes, right? Yeah, or when a plane it's, goes down. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's that sort of experience. And so for me, then, that means that there is something that is imposing itself upon me. There's some sort of neurosis that is there at the unconscious level. And for me, that's what I'm interested in exploring. And I think that that would be really fascinating for me to kind of in my own life. And, and I am digging through that. I'm, I'm curious about that. Why is that the case? But I know for a fact, at the very least, 
at least from an epiphenomenal sense. Maybe I like if I sit on the therapist couch, maybe there's some other things going on, but at least at, at the level of the epiphenomena, the reason that, or at least a large part of the reason that I'm afraid of death is because of that uh, Christian experience that I had for so long. Yeah, I have those same experiences as you. And as I've gotten older, I also have this kind of lessening of the fear of death, less sort of dwelling on it um, and more acceptance of it, which I think is natural. I think everyone kind of does that at their own pace, but they eventually do experience that. But at the same time, I think there's a difference between saying that, you know, fearing death, like fear is kind of not the most rational based emotion, right? <laughs> so right. you can say that death is a bad thing and kind of come to accept and not fear it in the same sense that like, you know, you accept that going to the doctor means getting a shot and it sucks that it's going to be kind of painful, but it's not a big deal, right? Like it's just, an, it's like a much bigger version of that. Like, but the, yeah, shot but the reason you don't fear it is because <laughs> you know that the shot is ultimately good for you. Death no, is an ultimate, right? I think you know that as a kid too. I mean, you're, you're told that that the shot's going to do good for you, but you still are fearful of the shot because it hurts. But eventually right. you're just like, you know what? It's not that big a deal anymore. Like, <laughs> I still think it's going to be bad. I'm not going to like the pain. I'm not going to like sh give myself shots on purpose, but it's not that big a deal. And you kind of do yeah. that with death too. You're like, yeah, I'm going to die, but you know, I've kind of come to accept that a little bit. Yeah. And still say it's bad. Maybe. Maybe it's bad. We don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. That, that's my, my ending conclusion. I don't know. I just, it, it just doesn't feel right. We'll just title this episode, We Don't Know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. You know, we know that you wanted us to have the answer to the ethics of suicide, and we just don't have the answer. You shouldn't have um, come to a philosophy podcast to get the answers to things. That should be I obvious. know. <laughs> that, that, I know. I'm sorry. Um, All right. So for hopefully for part three of this, we're going to have our friend Diana on to talk about some of the empirical and scientific and psychological questions revolving around suicide. Because we don't, we don't know shit about that. Well, at least right. I don't. Yeah. And, and so a lot of these questions that we're asking, too, about how this would pertain to suicide and, uh, and things like that, I think that because I know she listens to the podcast. So hi, Diana. Um, I know that she will be able to kind of like kind of jump in and, and we can kind of engage at those. A lot, all the questions that we're asking, I think, is probably how we, we would frame our third discussion. Yeah, definitely. Okay. But before we get to that, we have to do the sticky leaves. Sticky Leaves is where one of us talks about whatever it is that's giving our life meaning in a possibly absurd and meaningless world. So, Austin, what's, uh, what's like reducing the absurdity of your life this week? Everybody needs to go see Sorry to Bother You. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> it is out on DVD, and it's out on digital platforms all over the United States. People can find it. Uh, if you're elsewhere, just get a fucking VPN and watch it. Rent it. Pay money to Boots Riley. Uh, and to, I don't know who else, who else is getting paid on the back end, but sorry to bother you is fucking amazing. Um, it's always tough when a film is beefed up so much and it's so much hype surrounding it. You can get overinflated expectations, and then when you actually experience it, it's very difficult for the film to match those expectations. But this film for me was absolutely amazing, and as I kind of said at the end of Troy's shitty minute, I can't believe that this film was fucking made. This film should not have been made. This is not... This film is, like, blatantly anti-capitalist. Blatantly. And blatantly. And it's, it's not, not like subtle. symbolically. <laughs> yeah. There's no metaphor here. Like, it is blatant in its political outlook. And... Um, but then at the same time, it's also fucking batshit crazy and interesting and... I just think it's a really fantastic film that has layers and layers and layers of things to explore, both from like a, a cinematic artistic perspective and at like a thematic and conceptual level. And I think the performances are all great. Um, I have never, I mean, Lakeith Stanfield is, I think he's, he's one of my favorites because fucking on Atlanta, he is, for me, he is the best part of Atlanta. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, for sure. Um, but I mean, everyone across the board was great. Even Army Hammer, his, you know, two scenes or whatever that he's in. This is the best <laughs> I've seen him. He's fucking brilliant as this like douchebag 
venture capitalist billionaire, whatever the fuck he is, you know? Um, I, I just think across the board, it was a really well put together film. Everyone go fucking see it. And I know Troy really enjoyed it too, so. Yeah, and one thing I'll say that, I mean, I'm sure this, is, this sounds more like something you would talk about. It was joyous. Like, yeah. anti-capitalist films oftentimes are just so drab and boring and critical mm. and just like full of resentment and just kind of this ugly stuff, you know? Mm. But it was like joyous and anti-capitalist, right? Like, mm. you liked the characters. They weren't like dicks <laughs> you know even though you know um like Keith Stanfield's character is a dick for a lot of it right and he kind of mm-hmm. achieves redemption or whatever like you kind of like the people and you kind of see what's what's sort of um persuasive about it like what's the term you always use about if leftists want to be convincing and persuasive they need to be like winsome or whatever hmm. you know how you always make right. that argument yeah 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 um, that, that, would, that would be my argument yeah, exactly. It was kind of an, an example of that, wasn't it? Yeah, I 100% think so. This is one of the things I've been thinking through a lot lately. I've been, uh, you know, over the last like year and a half, two years, uh, I've been reading a lot of psychoanalysis. And I really love Todd McGowan, who is probably my favorite reader of Lacan at the moment. And part of the reason I love him so much is because he is so fucking winsome. And one of the things that he talks about is that, you know, the left right now doesn't really understand enjoyment or joy, but the right understands it. And part of the reason that you're seeing this resurgence uh, on the right or of nationalisms and things like that is because they sort of have the monopoly over joy at the moment. So there is this weird experience. And I was actually thinking about this and I was thinking that like, you know, part of the reason that Republicans are so viable is that they are like regular coca-cola and the part of the thing that democrats <laughs> seem so inviable is that they're diet coke you know but that's a wonderful analogy and so and, true and nobody wants to drink fucking diet coke because it doesn't <laughs> it's whatever unless you're my friend Kier who just drinks like 12 of them a day or donald trump who apparently drinks like 12 of them a day but it's diet coke it's not coca-cola it's claiming that it's the thing that's enjoyable but it's not really enjoyable but republicans can actually enjoy and he was actually talking on his podcast called Why Theory with his co-host. I can't remember what his name is, Ryan something. I think it's his former student. But they were saying something like that uh, – and I thought this was so interesting. They were saying that even like religious moralism is able to enjoy far more than secular moralism is. Secular moralism, you have to beat yourself up uh, and you have to like be like, ah, I'm, I'm relinquishing my whiteness and I'm relinquishing my privilege and I'm a self-hating middle-class white male, Arr, you know? Um, and he was like, one of the things that's so self-defeating about this kind of idea of, uh, of this moralism is that you actually are relinquishing the possibility of joy to the other side. And that when you understand how human psyche is essentially constructed through these various tensions between desire and joy and things like that, you start to realize that that program is really problematic. It's really deficient. But the right gets it. They fucking enjoy the shit out of it. Yeah, they have all these moralisms, don't have sex before marriage, but they just do it and then they just kind of like feel a little bit guilty about it. But nevertheless, they're still fucking riding that wave. And like I think that this film is kind of an inversion of that because this film shows a possibility of how you can be resistant and at the same time and how you can be political, how you can have a, a revolutionary uh, deconstructive outlook towards socioeconomic systems that you find oppressive and exploitative, but do it with some like infusion of joy. And I thought there was really something lovely about that. I think maybe that's part of the reason I love this film so much. Yeah, I mean, you talk about how the right has this like monopoly on enjoyment, right? Well, a lot of it's enjoying the resentment, right? This really that's exactly it. That's exactly enjoy, it, right? It's enjoyment of resentment. We see this everywhere. It's like the own the libs thing, right? Um, and the left's response to it is just like Nietzsche and bad conscience, right? Just that's whipping it, yourself. Man. Yeah. For enjoying anything, right? Um, and yeah, it doesn't have to be that way. Like, there are good things to enjoy, right? Like, you can enjoy camaraderie and companionship and helping people. And, like, there's all sorts of things that are super um, joyful that you can do that are perfectly consistent with, like, a revolutionary politics. There's no reason why it has to be all just, like, uh, crying and spilt milk and beating yourself up. Hmm. Agreed. And so fucking go see Sorry to Bother You. It's it's joyous. It's powerful. I mean, fuck, I, I, I want to see it again. I'm actually going to see it next week. There's a, a there's a political group here that's called Solidarity, and they're doing a screening of it. I'm going to go see it. Um, 
which will be interesting too because they're just a bunch of, you know, like lefties. So it'll be nice because I'm sure there'll be a discussion afterwards. But there are so many layers in this film. Uh, the black experience in America, the black experience um, under the conditions of capitalism. Um, then there's just like the generic criticism of capitalism. And then there's the idea of like unionization. And then... Um, then there are these really interesting psychoanalytic themes about like sex and desire and um, the sexuation of bodies. And then, of course, there are just like these amazing like relationship conflicts, you know, between like partners and a third person and boss uh, employee relations and then worker relations. I mean, there are so many different interesting ways to analyze this film that I think for years to come, we're going to see some amazing essays come out, books written, uh, video essays on YouTube, or well, the video essays on YouTube, probably the majority of them are going to be stupid, but um, we're going to see some <laughs> amazing literature come out by, by people analyzing this film over the years, and I'm really excited. Maybe I'll take part in it one day, because I'd love to look at sort of some of these psychoanalytic underpinnings of the film in particular, but fucking go see Sorry to Bother You Guys. It's, it's, it's great. Um, and it's coming out. It's getting international distribution. I think it's out in December in the UK. It's out in November here in Australia. Um, wherever else you are in the world, if you can't, if there are no distributional or uh, distribution dates for it, like I said, get a VPN and fucking uh, <laughs> stream it online because it's on all the platforms now, the streaming platforms, and you can rent it. And and normally I'm like fucking pirate shit, but we need more of these kinds of movies, so throw money to Boots Riley's way, even though I'm not sure how much he gets on the back end, but I'm sure he gets something. But fuck, Annapurna, they're the ones who uh, uh, that, that bought this film and, and released it. Give money to them too, because first of all, they're a great studio, but second of all, if they have the balls to release a movie like this, then maybe they're going to do other shit like this, so fucking throw money to them too. Yeah, definitely. If there's any film you're going to actually try to support, this would be the one. Fucking A, man. So... All right, sweet. So let's go ahead and end it there. Um, thank you guys so much for tuning in. And like we said, there will be a part three of uh, this this theme um, with the ethics of suicide with our friend Diana, who is a mental health expert. So uh, we'll get her on in a couple of weeks here whenever our schedules allow. Uh, in the meantime, feel free to follow us on uh, Twitter, owls at under, wait, owls underscore at underscore dawn. You can also go to Facebook if you don't do the Twitter thing, and you can email us at owls at dawn at, uh, owls at dawn podcast at gmail.com. What else? I might forget. You can also give us a five-star rating and review on iTunes. We'd really appreciate that. And I can't think of anything else except for one last thing. What's that, brother? Dasadani Americanski. <laughs>